Welcome to Vacation Station, hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. Michael Servan has authored five travel books focusing on Santa Barbara, California. He is the former restaurant critic and travel writer for the Santa Barbara News Press, and he's contributed nearly every public to nearly every publication in Santa Barbara. Basically, Michael knows Santa Barbara. We know that. Uh, we've mm-hmm. chatted with him on Big Blend Radio for a number of years, and we're excited to have him back on the show today to talk about his latest book. It's called Santa Barbara Know-It-All. He is a know-it-all in Santa Barbara. Uh, a guide to everything that matters, uh, unique in its approach. It is fun. It's got all kinds of hidden gems, uh, undiscovered wonders, at the best places to picnic. We like that. We Champagne like that. picnics, hikes. Uh, where to go for little cocktails, where to eat, like that where to stay according to your budget and needs, and all kinds of weird and fun and historical nitbits. Nitbits? Nitbits. That's titbits. <laughs> that's, I know that sounds good, right? Uh, but anyway, go to his website, servantscentralcoast.blogspot.com, and that's servants. C-E-R-V-I-N-S, servantscentralcoast.blogspot.com. And go get the book. Again, it's Santa Barbara Know-It-All, A Guide to Everything That Matters. It's available on Amazon, all those great stores. And and it's actually published today, April 15th, 2018, through Reedy Press. Hey, Michael, how's it going? Hey, Lisa. Hey, Nancy. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Hey, it's good to have you back. And now you can tell us all about your nitbits. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I didn't hey, want to comment on that. I wasn't sure what you're talking about there. <laughs> I don't know. I make my own words up. You know, yeah. that's the thing. And and this is the thing about your book. Uh, you really, when it, you talk about a book that is jam packed with goodies in there, um, it this is going to be a resource for Nancy and I uh, going through to Santa Barbara on our Spirit of America tour of national parks because you've got the Channel Islands in your backyard and also you're on the Juan Batista de Anza National Historic Trail, which we're on here in Tucson as well. So um, it's going to give us a lot of places to go check out, a lot of parks and picnic sites and walks and things that we can use, but um, definitely for our audience as well. You've got everything in there. How how many years did it take you to write this? (laughs) Well, um, this actually is a book that I wanted to write about um, eight years ago. I was doing another another book, another travel guide for Moon, which was a big company, and 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 I remember I, I was actually I was sitting on a yacht in Morro Bay because you know that's what travel writers do. We don't really do anything; we just hang out on right. yachts. But I kept thinking, you know, because I was contracted into writing this one particular book, but I kept thinking, but this is the book I want to write. Something that's fun, maybe a mm-hmm. little kind of snarky, smart uh, mouth, um, but just filled with information that people really want and need, not. Not the it's not the desire for a book to create. Here's a bunch of lists. Here's 25 hotels. Here's 13 yeah. restaurants. But the really stuff that I've vetted personally, uh, because as I mentioned, everything in the book, whether it's a restaurant or a hike or a hang glider, I mean I've done everything. So I can personally wow. respond to everything in that book because I've done them all, um, from scuba diving exactly. to to hiking. So uh, it was important to write a book. And I also I thought, you know, you guys know, you guys have done this, but why shouldn't travel be? Why shouldn't travel books and guides be more fun? Why shouldn't they be laugh out loud funny and to give people a sense of, of entertainment as long as education? See, it's about the nitbits. That's what I'm talking <laughs> <That's> about. <right. laughs> but it's, it's true. And we want the weird stuff, too. Yeah, travel is fun. We want the cemeteries. We want to know about the giant fig trees. You know, <laughs> it, we, we want to know it's about tripping. that. Kind of, yeah, and frog walls. I mean, that's cool. Right. I didn't even know you had a frog wall. You know, so there's all these really cool things in this, and uh, I'm excited. And I want to go to Santa Barbara now, but um, let's just touch on where Santa Barbara is for those who haven't been there or, you know, could be from the East Coast or a different country. Um, where Santa Barbara is, because it is a really unique region, because you also have wineries in, uh, behind you, and you cover the wine country and Solvang and Montecito and Summerland. People know that from TV. Um, so give everybody kind of an overview of what this covers geographically. Well, 
Well, actually, if you were, um, the, the book is only focused on Santa Barbara County. So it's not mm-hmm. focused on the Central Coast, which is kind of a longer region and incorporates, you know, three or four counties, depending on who's counting. Um, this is really just focused on not, not just the city, but Santa Barbara City and Santa Barbara County. So when people come here, it's just specific. And I always thought, you know, there's so many travel books, and I've read a couple that are so broad in their reach that, you know, because you're covering all these different regions, you don't really do a great job. So I thought a book focused just on Santa Barbara would be ideal. Now, we're located just two hours north of Los Angeles um, by car. Well, by car would be five hours, depending on traffic. Um, no, I'm kidding. It's Technically, it's two I hours. I know, Michael. It, I've been there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. You, if you've been on our freeways here. Um, but we're yeah, actually yeah. 90 miles north of Los Angeles. So um, normally, it's, a, it's an hour and a half, two-hour drive from Los Angeles. Um, the cool thing about what we are is, you know, Santa Barbara is just set on the beach. So we're mm-hmm. one of those kind of unique places where you look out to the, the ocean, and they look behind you, and you've got the mountains. So we're it's kind mm-hmm. of a small little shelf of land that has uh, just got this reputation for uh, being just this kind of beautiful Mediterranean environment um, because we are kind of, we're kind of secluded. There have actually mm-hmm. been a couple times that I've, you know, I've lived here for 20 years now, and there were a couple of times that just happened recently when if the freeway is shut down, we're literally cut off from everybody. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like we can't get to Santa Barbara. I mean, you can't get to Los Angeles. You can't get north. And that's only happened a couple of times because of uh, extreme disasters. But we're just this little shelf that's off by itself mm-hmm. right in front of the ocean with the mountains behind us. I mean, it's it's a beautiful area. I know it's known as America's Riviera. I mean, it's just the, it's colorful. Uh, you get the ocean views, and it just last time we went through there, it just is so charming. It, I mean, it's really charming, but it's not overly charming where it's not got the you know the side of funky in it. You know, it's got <laughs> funky town in there, and it's all the flowers. It's mm. so it's so so, so pretty. pretty. Um, but I, I do want to bring up the fact um, you know Santa Barbara's on the news a lot uh, with what happened with the fires, yeah. California yeah. fires in 2017, and um, people often will go and you know I even worry about what's going on in Napa with this too. In Houston with hurricanes, we had a bad year <laughs> of yeah, disasters, yeah. and and a lot of times people think, oh, we better not go, and you know we'll we'll wait until they get their feet back on the ground. But um, is that different for right now when you look at Santa Barbara? People should still come out and and play and have a good time. Absolutely, uh, you know I hate to say it because I was evacuated during my wife and I were evacuated yeah. during the fire, so we we experienced that firsthand. And then of course in the early 2018 of this year. You know, we had these horrible mudslides where, you know, uh, almost two dozen people were killed. And so we had just a whole host of problems, as everyone knows. But there was a report that came out that said, because they shut down the highway that led to us. Uh, and they, the, this report said that we lost, I don't know how they came at this amount, but $997,000 a day was lost in terms of tourism because literally people couldn't get in or out. Um, and that, you know, that, that hurts a lot of businesses. I have a lot of friends mm-hmm. here who own small businesses. And uh, a lot of them really got hurt. Some, several of them, unfortunately, have failed because, I mean, literally right after the fires and people were evacuated, then we had the mudslides and then people were evacuated. And then we just had mm. a bunch of rains in the last few weeks and people were evacuated again. And so it just, it's been an ongoing sort of problem for, for months. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're just so happy if anybody <laughs> gets in their car or flies in or takes the train up here. Uh, we, you know, we're so grateful because so many businesses – uh, really suffered. Everyone I know uh, suffered financially uh, from the devastating losses we had, including myself. And I'm a writer, mm-hmm. but I, I, you know, I actually lost a little bit of money, and I'm not going to complain about that because we have friends who actually lost their their house, uh, and that's right. just a horrible thing. So we, you know, anybody who wants to come visit us, and it's the same with Napa and Sonoma and 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 other places you mentioned. We all need people to say, hey, it's safe to go there. We want to support the local businesses uh, because we really rely on that and. Uh, we're as vulnerable as anybody. So when you exactly. get people who want to spend their money, even for a day, you come up for half a day. You know, as I said, it's a two-hour drive from Los Angeles. Uh, you come up, uh, you spend half a day here, a day, or whatever. Uh, we would be so thrilled with that. So. And take Santa Barbara Know It All with you. I mean, That's it's true. true. <laughs> this is what. It's, okay, this is the deal. You know, when you go places, you know, this is you know, travel writer. We get to like even national parks. We get to hang out with you know the rangers or. We'll have someone take us around and tell us about all the the really neat, you know, cool snippets of a town. <laughs> it's my new word. It's saying. Um, I like it. They tell us all these things, and and we, you know, we've had friends that have gone to parks with us, and they're like, 
oh my God, this is so cool. You know, I get to hear all these stories that you don't hear as a regular traveler or tourist. And I think with your book that you, it's like having your own personal guide where you can go, okay, this is the fun stuff I want to know about. It allows you to have that, you know, someone's not telling you what to do. Like, you know what I mean? It's a, you can cultivate your own trip, but have all the insider cool, fun stuff, you know, and those stories uh, that I think are so important. And it really gives Santa Barbara a sense of place. And it's something Nancy and I always talk about on the shows is, you know, really good destinations are destinations that have kept their sense of place. When you, there's no other Santa Barbara in this country. There isn't, right, you know, right, and exactly. Santa Barbara uh, really has its own, you know, identity. And I think uh, that's something that's really strong in your book, uh, showcasing that, that it's unique. Well, and that's one of the things I really wanted to do. And I, I, I mentioned in the, in the beginning of the book that I, I won't cover any chain restaurants or chain hotels because you can find those anywhere. You know, you can find yeah. anything wrong with Holiday Inn, for example. Holiday Inn is great, but you can find that anywhere. What you want is something, as you alluded to, um, Lisa, something that's unique to Santa Barbara. Where can you stay in a hotel that's either family-owned or local-owned or, or just unique to us because of our history or because of what it's been through? Um, and, you know, I also don't do lists of, like, the things you have to do because, you know, everyone's different. They all want something different. I just know when I travel, I really search out those things that are unique and unusual. And then what can I find that I can't find in my hometown? And I think that's what more and more people are looking for as they're traveling. It's like, you know, we've done the chain restaurants. We've stayed at the big hotels. What's something, what's that unique experience that cannot be replicated unless I come here? So that was really kind of my goal. And the fact is, um, I have to also bring up not the fact that you've, you know, been writing in publications uh, for Santa Barbara and about Santa Barbara and also around the world. I know you're a world traveler and um, in, in, in travel this country, too. And I know, uh, you know, you've done a lot of travel in parks, so we all share that common interest. And in, to me, though, the other thing people need to know is that you know what you're doing when it comes to tasting. You're a professional wine and spirits writer, a judge, and listen, he knows where good water is, and that is a big deal when you travel and where, wherever you live, so that's a big, big deal. Uh, so you, you have good taste. You know, if you can be a water judge, you have good taste, Michael. <laughs> well, you know, it's one, it's one of those weird things that people go, so you do what? You judge water? And like, yeah, you know. And uh, In fact, I was just uh, every uh, year for the last couple of years, I've been part of the Global Bottle Water Awards, uh, which last year were held in Barcelona before their home Prague. Um, and I've been fortunate to, to not only judge these waters of the world, um, but, you know, kind of to that point, the unique, we're all looking for things that are unique and have a footprint of where they, where they were created. Um, mm. Water can be that way, so can wine and spirits because they're created you know, with, with the, the local agriculture and local water. But, and it's the same thing to me with the travel book and, and any good travel writer and, and, and the national parks. I mean, the beautiful thing that, as you mentioned and alluded to about the national parks, and I, I'm with you guys. I'm a huge parks fan, and I wish more people would go visit our parks, even the Channel Islands here, um, because they're, you can't find this anywhere else. The De Anza Trail okay. only runs, you know, it's only one trail. It runs a, a long way, but we've got it here. And we've got the Channel Islands, um, you know, National Preserve off our coast. And uh, I, I really hope people can get out there. I've been out there multiple times, um, not only hiking, but scuba diving and, and snorkeling and kayaking. Because it's just, oh, cool. you, you can't replicate that anywhere. So, I, you know, I want people to come to Santa Barbara. I've had an experience where they go, man, this was so much fun. I want to come back. Uh, not because, exactly. hey, we went to Baby Gap and got some clothes. Again, nothing wrong with that. But that you found maybe clothes from a local clothing store um, like Chicken Little, which is one of our great little um, stores here that caters to kids, because it's unique to what we do. Mm -hmm. I think so, too. And going to the National Park side, you know, I'm, I'm so glad about the Anza Trail. I mean, it goes uh, from Mexico in, in our backyard here in Tucson all the way up to San Francisco where the Presidio is. And it's really amazing that this trail, this is how San Francisco became that's the beginning of its foundation you know and i yeah. and i'm like wow this is and this was going on when the country was you know being becoming america <laughs> you know it was 1776 <laughs> and i'm so addicted to this trail and this year is the 50th anniversary of our national trail system whether it's historic trails a scenic trail uh you know hiking trails like the appalachian trail or the pacific crest trail so to me it's really important that we search these out and Nancy and I always say, like, we're actually, you know, we all like to take road trips, but we're going, take these trails as a family project, as a road trip route, you know. You go from here in Tucson, go up to Santa Barbara, and you're, you're going to have some, you know, 
you're going to have some similarities in regards to there's missions. So we share something in common, but then it's going to be completely different, even how they're built, because we're in the desert and you have beach sand. We have, <laughs> well, we have ancient sea sand with sharks yes. yeah. too. <laughs> so it's different, but it's, um, I think it's really exciting. And the Juan Batista Danza Trail, I've, you know, there are towns that, are prominent in the history of this and they don't even recognize it they or know about know. it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. you're on Anza Road. Don't you ever wonder who Anza is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you mention that. A, a, because I've got a section in my book where I, I talk about street names uh, right. here in Santa Barbara because there, there's always this history to these things. But secondarily, and I agree with you, um, not only the Anza Trail, but the California Mission Trail, the reason, mm. the reason California is the way it is is because of those two events. Uh, which mm -hmm. happened, granted, hundreds of years ago, but Highway 101, which is one of our main highways that goes from Los Angeles all the way up through uh, through past San Francisco, those were originally the roads that the Anza took and the missions took. So these are old, actually historic routes that were were created hundreds of years ago, and now we drive by going, you know, 75, well, 80 if you're my wife, but you drive really fast on it, and you, you don't really think about that these were actually created, you know, 300 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, Highway 101 is it's that's a huge trip. I know. Yeah, you know, it, I think it's important if you have children, especially, that you follow a trail so they can really understand the history, the history you know, so they can remember it as opposed to, you know, cramming for an exam and then forgetting everything a day later. <laughs> Which is Absolutely, <laughs> and, and 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 you know the, the, when you can drive or when you can take a train because you know we've got some great trains that run through uh, through Santa Barbara and here mm. in California. You know you can actually spend time looking out the window and observing and and understanding you know what the the original explorers went through when they were traveling through this what was in Santa Barbara originally was a barren land. You know people come here. You mention the trees and people look around Santa Barbara and we've got all this foliage everywhere. We got trees everywhere and it was like oh my gosh it's so beautiful here and yet. If you, if you look at the old photographs, we were in, you know, we're a semi-arid environment here in Santa Barbara, but it doesn't seem that way because we've got all these great trees, all these beautiful lush gardens, uh, but you know, historically, we're we're pretty barren. But yeah, but here we are. We've created we've created something new um, from what what we were in the 1880s to what we are now. Um, and the, the fun part to me is that people keep discovering and and. Um, learning about history. I, I try to make history fun in my book. So you have some context mm -hmm. of where you are, but it's not a history lesson in terms of people going, okay, can we move on? Um, you know, we yeah. want, we, I want, I want people to learn something. And I try and I do a thing called bullet point history for each, uh, for each chapter, for each town, um, just to kind of narrow it down to something that's pretty simple and fun and easy to read. So people at least hopefully will, will whip their whistle with that. And then if they want to discover more, they can read further into that or just go off and explore. You teach us how to say Chumash. <laughs> you, you know, that's because the Native American history is so fascinating on the coast as well. And, and, and you know, I was, I was just like the Highway 101. I was just, my mind was like, yeah, that's another vacation we can all do, you know. And it's just there's so much. You know, going through the book, you you I didn't realize how much there is in Santa Barbara. I had no idea. And what I like, too, is you keep talking about the train is that you can take the train like from LA, San Diego or Amtrak, you know, and get into Santa Barbara, which means you don't even have to drive. So, you know, help keep the, the you know, the air clean. <laughs> so you don't have to drive if you don't want to. Uh, you can just, well, you know, rent it's a car you there. It's actually good you said that because we have a, we have a program called Car Free. Um, and so if you take the train up from, say, Los Angeles or maybe down from San Francisco because it goes against the entire length of the state, um, because the train station mm -hmm. drops you off literally two blocks from the beach. This great old train station built in 1904. Um, beautiful inside, although people don't, you know, they don't, they, you know, the art of train stations is kind of lost to a degree. But if you come here, there are hotels that will offer discounts because you didn't bring your car. So when you stay with them, they'll give you typically a 10% discount to come hang out at their hotel car free. Um, and, you know, we're a small town, so it's easy to get around if you want to run a bike. You can always Uber if you need to or get a taxi. Um, so, and we, of course, have a trolley system, which uh, will drive you around pretty inexpensively um, to hit up some of the main, main, the main places. But the great thing is if you did take the train, and I've talked to people about this before, and I, I know a lot of people who've done this, they've come up for the day, and they don't even need a car, because they can hang around the downtown area, they're by mm -hmm. the beach, they're by what we call the funk zone, which is a kind of cool, cool little um, arts, wine tasting, beer tasting, restaurant area, 
Um, you can walk there. You can walk to downtown, a little State Street area. State Street is our is our main drag, and then you get the train to go home and do that in a day. And it's a, it's a great little day trip. Fairly inexpensive on the train, so uh, it's you don't necessarily need the car to be here. I like that. I think that's important. Cool. And and the Channel Islands. This is something you know. There's not that many island parks. I mean, we do have them. But this is different, and I think that's again. And we were talking about you know that uniqueness, and and to be able to go out even on whale watching trips out there. But you're talking about kayaking and hiking. What I like about places like that in in parks and and the Channel Islands has it is that there's you know flowers and plants and animals and birds that you're not going to see anywhere else. They're endemic to the island. Right. And to me, that is just so fascinating because it's just new ecosystems to look at. <laughs> I get into that. Absolutely. In fact, there's a plant called Coreopsis, which is there's a certain version of that that's only found on Santa Cruz Island. And oh, wow. you, won't, you won't see it here on the mainland. Uh, and, you know, the, the Channel Islands, from if you went direct through Santa Barbara, it's just 26 miles out. So it's the length of a marathon. I run a marathon, so I don't know if I could run on water, but, I, you know, I know the distance. You can get out there easy. And the great thing about, like, Santa Cruz is part of our national park and also a marine sanctuary is that if you scuba dive like me or if you can snorkel, you will see a lot of um, uh, life out there in the water, including Garibaldi, which is our state fish, which I love Garibaldi. They're the coolest little fish because they're so quirky. Um, but you can get out there and see that. We have ravens out there. We have the Channel Islands fox, which is endemic to uh, a region of small little tiny fox about the size of my cat. So um, it's wow. it's wonderful. And the great thing to me about the Channel Island, and again, there's four of them within eye shot of the coast, which you have access to, is that this is old school California. There's there are a few buildings here and there. There's a lighthouse on one of the islands and a few other buildings. But for the most part, if you go hiking out there, if you spend the night out there, you're in territory that has been basically untouched for the most part uh, for the last, you know, how many, 10,000 years. Um, now, the Chumash used to live out there, which is which is great. Um, so there's a great history, of, you know, with the, with the Chumash Indians out there. But it's also you can go out there and you can get lost. And you can just be away from you know, the kind of mundane things. You're not, you're not seeing concrete, you're not seeing roads, you're not seeing a lot of buildings, you're not seeing all these things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes you just want to get away and go yeah. to some place that existed, you know, 700,000 years ago. And you can go do that. And I think that's I so wonderful. That. And, and uh, you know, you can get there within an, an hour and a half or two hours, um, even, even shorter, depending on where you take off from. And I always encourage people, hey, you know, take a great day. You can, get, you can do a day trip for six hours. You get out there and back. You've been on the island. Uh, old school California, and uh, you can come home, and then you can go to have a nice dinner. So, I like that. He could be out there on the on the island, and a dinosaur comes out. I know Nancy's <laughs> all into anything ancient and Jurassic. You know, yeah. that's it. She's into the Jurassic. Okay, speaking of Jurassic, if you go think of Jurassic Park, but you know that the other part is there's so much pop culture and Hollywood history in your mm -hmm. area, including Sideways. I know a lot of wine lovers are into that movie. Uh, but there's, I mean, you've got like soap operas and it, it has, it called Hollywood and it's not that far from Hollywood yet. It's a, it, that's amazing about it. It's like, this is when you've hit the central coast to me. There's just like, suddenly you're out of Hollywood. This is it. <laughs> this is the place. Well, it's funny you say that because, uh, Back in the early 1910s, 1915, there was a, a movie studio called Flying A Studios, which was here in Santa Barbara, actually on Chuck Paula Street. And it was at that time the largest film studio in the world. And it wasn't in Hollywood, it was here in Santa Barbara. Now, eventually, of course, they moved south to, uh, to, to Hollywood. But, you know, we are home to really the burgeoning film industry as it began. Um, not only that, I mean, you can also tie that into Oprah, who lives here, uh, and and Jack Johnson, and 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 Ellen DeGeneres, and everybody else, if you want to, because we have a lot of celebrities who live here because they like being away from from Hollywood. But there is an amazing sense of history here in terms of uh, not only Hollywood, but you know, Santa Barbara back in the in the old days was a great environment to film in because that you know we were you know, if you wanted something that looked like a western town we had that if you wanted hills if you wanted beaches if you wanted sand dunes we had all these great different things. In fact, Cecil Bill DeMille, who originally filmed the original Ten Commandments in 1922, actually filmed that up here in Santa Barbara um, because the sand dunes out on the Guadalupe area these massive dunes you've ever been out there it's really windy and the sand keeps shifting around and he he uh, he filmed the exodus scene from Egypt up there because we had these sand dunes that resembled Egypt. And uh, we've got a great history going, going back 
a long, long ways, and it's just some fascinating things about, uh, you know, our history here that, that people don't know, because it's, I'm kind of proud of the fact that we were like the first Hollywood as it were, um, mm. even though, you know, <laughs> we're not known for that now, but there were, and of course, there still continues to be films that are shot here, um, and TV shows that were shot here, and you mentioned Santa Barbara, um, the soap opera, I was actually on that soap opera when I was an actor no in Hollywood. Yeah, I had, I was on, it's called, you, you're, you signed up as what you call a day player, so you're on for one day, you have a couple lines, and I was actually on that soap opera, and I occasionally still get residual checks from, you know, like Hungary and Ukraine and weird places that they show Santa Barbara, uh, the soap opera, well, and what's cool. funny is, one of the cool things is, I travel, as you mentioned, I travel a global lot, and when I say I'm from Santa Barbara, almost everybody's heard of Santa Barbara, in part because of that soap opera, which only ran for like nine years. It wasn't, it wasn't a long-lived show. But, you know, we, we have this reputation. Some of it's incorrect because they look at Santa Barbara and say, everyone's wealthy, everyone's tan. Well, yeah, I am, but, you know. Um, it, <laughs> but it's interesting. We have this, uh, this great history and this relationship with Hollywood that actually predates Hollywood. It's a, to me, Not this is that. the most important thing, though. Because it is the creature from the Black Lagoon being filmed there. <laughs> that to me yeah. is like you so you cool. you should have awards for that because it's like that or the Day of the Triffids, either one of those. If yeah. you if you if your city filmed you know was there, that's cool. That's like classic, <laughs> cool cool sci-fi history. I love that. I love that it was filmed there. So you know you've got a lot of musicians and a lot of festivals. That was the thing. Your festivals, I mean, I, they're they're crazy and cool. And then you've got really cultural ones. But I, you guys know how to have fun at your events. Well, <laughs> we have two main huge festivals that draw in literally about 100,000 people each, uh, which is Solstice, which kind of began in the mm -hmm. early 1970s as this kind of like offbeat, under the radar, anti-establishment parade, which has now grown into this massive uh, parade where it's still kind of retains its roots of just weird people making floats and going down the street um, to musicians and to, you know, choreography and, and all sorts of crazy things. And it, you can still find drumming circles. And uh, it's, cool. it's, it's still a throwback to the 70s, even though it's been kind of a little bit kind of gentrified because it used to be a little more mm, risque, shall we say. Um, and that's a huge festival. But I think almost maybe more importantly is our Fiesta, which is a five-day festival. Uh, which really started in the 1920s to celebrate our Spanish heritage. Uh, a lot of people don't remember that now because we uh, people come up here and they go, woohoo, we're eating tacos and drinking margaritas, which is great. Um, but it really is, is an homage to our Spanish heritage because, you know, California and certainly Santa Barbara, you know, before, before it had Mexican rule, it was ruled by the Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so Spain owned this property for a long time. Um, and then, of course, the Mexicans fought the Spanish, and the Mexicans took it over, and then we fought the Mexicans, kicked them out, we took it over. And, and there's, you know, you can even go back to uh, the, the Russians were down here, uh, you know, a long, long time ago, um, doing a lot of trading. So, you know, California's got a great history, and Santa Barbara's got this amazing history. And the funny thing is about that, Lisa and, and Diana, is, is that my wife is always, she's from back east. So you look mm -hmm. at history and you see the building, you see the, the statue, you see the this, that, and the other. Well, the history we have here in California, not unlike with you guys in Yuma, is that you don't always see everything because a lot of the, the Indian uh, tribal cultural was not built on creating, uh, you know, these sort of monuments. We have petroglyphs, we have hieroglyphs out here, uh, we have cave paintings. But they're very understated, and so you don't go and see some big building, but you have to, as we talked about earlier, you have to get on a trail and go find these mm. petroglyphs that were done by, uh, by the native Shumash in the early 1700s, or go up to Painted Cave, which actually is one of our national parks, um, which is, I think, the smallest national park that we, or state park in California, but we have these old cave paintings from the early 1700s that the original Indians had done. So there's a lot here that's not visible, but it's there if you go seek it. That's exactly the the, mm -hmm. the cool thing. Uh, you know, going through the book, I'm like, I love the fact that you put picnic spots because <laughs> we need yeah. to have picnics. Okay, so you know, Nancy and I, we take a hike and then we have our champagne picnic, and yeah. that's how we. That if you want to, if you want to photograph birds, you you don't need the big lens. Okay, you just need a bottle of champagne. <laughs> it's the most amazing <laughs> they, they, technique. Hummingbirds know that you have champagne. There is something they, they really do. or white wine between the two. Somehow birds know. I don't know what it is, but it they they come out. They I think they I don't know if it's the yeast. I don't know. Uh, you know, but they come out. But the fact that you put picnics, I think, is something that 
people need to do more of because there's nothing like just getting some fresh air, relaxing, you know, taking in the views, uh, going with a friend or loved ones. I mean, it's just the coolest thing to do. And so many times when we go on vacations, we'll go to a destination, we'll actually run ourselves off, you know, off our feet. You know, it's like, we need to go to this museum, go to that museum. And by the time you come home, everything's kind of whirling around in your mind. And now you're, you need a vacation from your vacation. So we need right, picnic right. spots to balance this out Just with champagne. Time. Yeah, yeah. Now if, okay, picnic spot. Okay. So where would you go? Like if for someone like Nancy and I, we want to go see birds and I know there's some bird refuges you were talking about was it Andrew Clark but uh, where would you go you know for being able to see birds and just have the total nature fix but I want to know what Nancy and I both want to know what's in the picnic basket what kind of nidbits yeah. are you getting because the local <laughs> food that's the other thing go in to the local shops and try and get local foods or local wines as close as you can what where would you go to fill your basket and what would you put in there well, that's, that's a really good point, and I'm a big fan. You know, I put, I put, I think, five or six picnic spots in there, because if you're in Santa Barbara, it's easy to, like, we'll go down to the beach, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can. But there's also other places that are a little more hidden, a little more kind of offbeat that I put in there because I've been there. Uh, I, my wife and I picnic um, as often as we can uh, to just grab some local food and go off someplace and just mm -hmm. uh, either with other people or just by ourselves. Uh, and usually mm -hmm. always take wine with us because we're we're, we're big wine drinkers. Um, but the, the, you mentioned the bird refuge, and that's that's got such a that kind of resonates so deeply within me personally um, because I love birds like you do. And there's a lot of birds on this bird refuge. It's in the title, of course, it's the bird refuge. But it's right down by the beach, so you're actually at easy access. It's right it abuts the zoo, so you mm -hmm. you can actually see some of the traps and some of the animals from the bird refuge. Um, and we have white pelicans and egrets and, and all sorts of birds cool. that come onto this great little uh, area. And if you take a couple trails, anybody can pull up to where the parking spot is. But if you go to your right and you start going down the trail, there are a couple of benches that are set out on little platforms over the water, which to me makes it even more special because you're not sitting back looking at it. You're actually literally on top of the water and it's surrounding cool. you and you're, you're kind of like jetted out into, into the, the, the bird refuge. And cool. Oh wait, me, this is where the creature from the Black this Lagoon is, yeah. <laughs> is gonna get you. That's it. No, well, yeah, funny, no, that's, the, that's cool. The funny thing about that is that the bird refuge, as it is now, was originally planned to be our harbor back in the 1920s. But oh, wow. uh, everyone said, no, 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 we want something else, and so they moved the harbor um, a couple miles up the road when they should have just put it there. But now, fortunately, we have the bird refuge. Um, but there's so many wonderful things that are made here. There, there. If you love chocolate, there's a guy uh, named, named Michael Dawson who actually creates 24 blackbirds, and it's it's actually bean to bar chocolate. But the great thing about what he's doing is it's actually vegan chocolate. There's no milk product in it. There's no dairy in it. It's just cacao mm. and sugar. And so he's created 24 blackbirds, which I talk about in the book. Great stuff if you like really just pure expressions mm. of chocolate. Um, Santa Barbara Pistachio Company, which I personally am addicted to, um, grows our pistachios here in town and makes a bunch of different flavors, family owned. And even even around, you know, what I mentioned, the Spunk Zone, and there's a, some restaurants down there, one called Metropolis. Um, there's also the St. Helena Bakery, where you can go and you can actually get picnic baskets made for you, or you can order stuff if you want to. Um, for the express purpose of saying, here's your basket, go down to the beach, go hang out, yeah. you can walk wherever you want to, uh, and the, the bird refuge is you know, you, you, it's a little bit further away, but you, there are places now in town where you can get a, a basket made on the fly. Uh, if you no don't want to make up your own thing, yeah, Metropolis is great. As I said, um, um, St. Helena Bakery has specifically designed, um, including wine, uh, baskets that you can actually take with you, walk two blocks down the beach if you just want to hang down by the water and do that and to make it real we're on our way right now michael <laughs> okay. we're, we're on our way, way. Things put together. <laughs> yeah uh, no, because I mean, that's awesome that just shows you know that there's a quality of life that comes through this you know that that santa barbara has this quality of life and if you have places making picnic baskets for you that is I mean, I that it's I like nothing that. better than that, man. You can you can ask them to put something in for the creature. Yeah, yeah, we need to have crackers yeah, for the creature. Yeah, no, that's what. You know, the other thing that um, really I I got excited about was the butterfly grove. Um, is oh, it is yeah. it Golita? Am I saying that right? That butterflies and frogs, uh, <laughs> the frog wall. 
Um, but the butterflies, <laughs> isn't that something that happens like at, at a certain time of year in your region where monarchs come through? Am I, no, that, that is correct. In fact, we there there are butterfly groves, and they're predominantly monarch butterflies uh, that do a migration. So we have in Goleta, and you're right, that's how we pronounce it, Goleta, which actually is an old Spanish word for ship. So it was a certain okay. kind of ship, and so Goleta actually was named for that. Anyhow, um, we've got a butterfly grove here in Santa Barbara. There's one up in Pismo, um, which is about two hours north of us. And then up in Monterey, in Carmel, there's another beautiful um, monarch grove. And so these three are all, all kind of connected because the monarchs come down every year and they migrate. And the numbers have been dwindling a little bit and they kind of resurge and then kind of decline a little bit. So, you know, we're concerned about, about that. Um, but the great thing mm -hmm. about all of these groves, including the one here in, in, in Goleta, is that there's always someone there who can explain to you the life of a monarch. And you probably know this. You know, they have a very but they have a rough life uh, from from being caterpillars to to doing doing incubation and then and then coming out as butterflies and they don't live that long and uh, mm. it, it they're truly it, it, there's nothing like walking into a grove that is virtually silent except for the flapping sound of butterfly wings and it's it's, mm. it's a very peculiar experience because it's almost everything's hushed because people don't talk loud which they shouldn't. But you see all these amazing butterflies literally on the ground, on the trees, they're everywhere. Some are mating, some aren't. I mean, it's just it's a whole other world. But it is just this amazing, almost jaw-dropping sense of you are in a different world watching these creatures do what they do. Sometimes they will land on you. They will just, mm -hmm. you know, they will just alight on your arm or on your head. Uh, that's not infrequent. And you are a guest in this amazing, beautiful, sort of almost cathedral of, of insects that are they've been transformed it. into these beautiful creatures and and it, to me it's a privilege to walk into one of those and to learn about them. maybe you don't know much about them hopefully that inspires you to say hey what, what do these guys do how long do they live what what is the purpose of life yeah. um, so our in our grove is actually right near the beach so you can actually access it and then you can actually continue on and head down to the ocean if you want to and it's a small grove but we have probably three to five thousand butterflies that are that are there in season Wow. And this is so, to me, it's magical when you're talking about that too and being able to hear their wings. It's the same thing with birds. Like, we need to get a naturalist on the show because we want to know what makes dove wings do that. You know, they sound like they need oil. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, and hummingbirds, mm. when you're out in nature, you can hear, you you know, birders, avid birders go by calls. Um, and then there's this other level of listening to wings to know what kind of birds, you know? So when you're talking about butterflies, I think that is so cool. You know, to me, it's magical because uh, in zoos and, and some of these places, they bring in frozen butterflies, which I, it freaks me out. That's just, this is my personal thing. <laughs> I, I don't think we should be doing that. I think we should be having more preserved areas so that this can be like this natural thing. And whenever you get to have that opportunity, like you're saying, is to start, hey, how did this happen? And, and who would think that the butterflies want to go to the beach, man? That's cool. <laughs> and maybe what can we do to like protect them? Um, do you, what, what is the season that that happens in? And then um, let's talk about the weather and, and when to come out to Santa Barbara. Well, the, the butterflies typically around March um, uh, oh, during their migration itself. So uh, typically, you know, March through April. And it, it's been varying because of climate change. It sort of like kind of messed things up a little bit in terms of mm -hmm. it's not as consistent as it used to be. And, you know, the, the little butterflies are like, you know, you know they can make 2,000 miles during it. They're stunning creatures for being so small and seeming to be so insignificant. Mm -hmm. they, they have an amazing ability to travel great distances. Um, and one of the reasons we have a grove here is because we have eucalyptus trees, which is one of their favorite uh, spots. So all the groves, you know, I mentioned here, all up in Pismo Beach, and then also up in, in Monterey, they're all they're all groves of, uh, of eucalyptus trees, which are not native to here. Right. They're native to Australia, but they were brought here in the 1880s. And so we've got these amazing strands of, uh, of, of uh, eucalyptus trees everywhere, which smell wonderful. I love that smell. And um, so, you know, we've got this great little, it's called Elwood Grove, which is where the, uh, where the, the, um, the butterfly refuge is and it's this mm. grove of just these magnificent tall beautiful eucalyptus trees and you can go out there and just hang out and and uh you, you know i i have butterflies that come into my yard and i've actually watched some as they as the caterpillars have like eaten um some of the milkweed and then decide they want to you know put their cocoon there 
and I've actually documented it. Actually, I wrote a, a blog post on my blog, Surf and Silver Coast, uh, about the butterflies in my backyard, which was just amazing to me because I'm watching what they do and the distance they traveled within my yard. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how industrious they are. And I feel sometimes bad, like, am I lazy? Am I not doing more in life? Because these little guys are able to accomplish so much. And, uh, I think it, that's it is, cool you have them in your backyard. And, and mm -hmm. by the way, I enjoy uh, not only the cat photos, yeah. <laughs> kitten <laughs> photos um, <laughs> on, on Tuesdays, but um, you often photograph your know, quail and all the bunnies and, you know, to see them. And everyone, you can also follow Michael on Twitter at Michael Servin. Um, what I, I like is, you know, you're showing these native, you know, animals and birds coming in. And um, I'm just saying it would be, you know, I know you guys like to garden too. The certified wildlife ha uh, backyard habitat, like that is a cool program. And, and I think, you know, what you're talking about having the milkweed and the, there's monarch way stations that people can do in their homes or yeah, not, yeah. well, not inside, outside. Yeah. But even, you know, hotels and stuff, we're starting to see it as we travel more and more hotels, uh, you know, adopting green practices. And the first thing they start to do is, well, let's look at our landscaping. And should it be native plants that will attract native, you know, um, animals and birds and, and, you know, do that kind of thing, put out water for birds and, and critters. So we're seeing a lot of that. When it comes to the hotels in your area, are you seeing that kind of movement happening, you know, whether it's, you know, creating a backyard habitat or, um, you know, going solar or, you know, not using chemicals in their laundry, that kind of thing? Uh, absolutely. We, you know, in 1969, there was a huge oil spill that happened off the coast of Santa Barbara. And uh, that was kind of the genesis of, of sort of our modern um, movement to to understand how we're harming our planet. And if you go back and you look at Google, you pull up the 1969 oil spill. I mean, it was a massive issue that affected the entire country and really started people uh, realizing that we have to do better. Uh, so we have a lot of hotels that don't use chemicals. Uh, a lot of them are, are really aware of that. Um, but also, one thing I was going to say is golf courses. We have several golf courses out here that actually are work with the Audubon Society mm. so that they are refuges. So when birds are migrating through, they have created a space where these birds can uh, pause and rest and then continue on their migration way. So the Glen Annie Golf Course is one of them. There's a couple others that do that. And it's exciting to me because I, I live up in the foothills, so I'm not down by the beach. I'm up in the little hills here. And so because of that, I'm surrounded by animals all the time. So mm -hmm. I've counted like 35 different species of birds in my yard over the years. And, uh, you know, I've got, we've got raccoons, we've got skunks, we've got coyotes and bobcats and, you know, everything. Cool. And it, it's fun for me because I feel like I try to create my yard as I've actually not joked about it, but actually mentioned it on Facebook and other things. That I call it the the serving, you know, nature preserve. Because I look yeah. at my yard and it's like, well, I want to create something that's not necessarily for me. I mean, it is for me because I get the pleasure of watching it. But to create an environment where animals come here and they feel safe. And I photograph a lot of bunnies who come and just sleep in my yard. <laughs> I mean, they just like lie down in the sun and kind of go, I'm taking a nap. Which I, so I find cool. to be so cool to me because... They clearly feel safe. Maybe they don't feel safe in another yard, maybe because there's dogs or something like that, but that's okay. But they can come here and they can feel completely safe. Um, I love quail. I had a family of quail last year that literally came and, and there was a, a, a mom and a dad and three chicks, and they literally hung out on this one little mound of dirt for about three hours, which I've never Aww. seen before. But I thought, I, was like, I just feel, it made me so happy because I, it's not that I did anything, but there's an environment that's been created that they can feel comfortable and safe and not feel threatened because, you know, animals feel threatened and when they do, they don't eat and there's loss of habitat. And it's the same thing with Santa Barbara. You know, we want people to come here, but we also want to treat our marine life correctly. We want to treat um, yeah. the coyotes who come down from the hills correctly as well as, well as our own little, uh, you know, cats and dogs we have at our house. Um, so for me, to respect and treat all animals is of paramount importance, whether they're domesticated cats like I have, or, or whether you take your dog to a dog run here in Santa Barbara, or you just go off and you can watch white pelicans um, at the bird refuge. It's so important that oh. we respect that. And um, because we are at the, you know, we're at the top of the food chain, right? As humans, we're, we're at that top level. So therefore, it seems to me that, that we have to respect everything that's beneath us in terms of respecting that, creating an environment of, 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 of balance yeah. and habitat for all the animals, because... Not, we don't rule over them, but because we're the most intelligent of the species, I think it's a greater obligation to take care of them. I yeah, I agree with you. I mean, that's For something sure. that 
I think that the more we go into these wild spaces and see wildlife and plant life in their habitats, we start to get this understanding, you know, and I think things like Instagram have helped things where people are post a photo and they're like, oh, I have to go look up what this plant is or what this butterfly <laughs> is. You know, it's like I can't just go post a selfie and, and don't fall into the Grand Canyon, people. Um, but it's, right, it goes right. beyond this where you actually have to, you know, you look. So I think in you know social media, we can, you know, go on to how everybody's treating each other politically. But on the nature side, you know, we're learning these plants and animals, and I think it starts to foster an appreciation and a respect. Um, I, I did want to say, you know, when you talk about going like to the Channel Islands or refuges or going to the beach and kayaking, you know, we take chemicals everywhere we go as human beings. It's on our skin, and you know, they talk about, you know, people swimming with dolphins, thinking this is a cool thing, but dolphins getting sick because of the suntan lotion people are wearing or whatever soaps and things like that. So when you go out into these areas, have a, just think about what you're carrying in. Always don't leave everything there. Uh, only take memories, right? But there's the parks here, even in Saguaro National Park, where we are here in Tucson. You know, Nancy and I were seeing we went on a trail. They now have um, things to uh, brush your, your hiking boots off before you go in so you don't bring invasive species from your garden or from another place into the national park. They're doing it at Pinnacles National mm -hmm. Park, especially if you go in caves because of that uh, white white nose white nose thingy that happens Disease, to bats. Fungi. Yeah, so right, we're seeing right, right. more and more movements about it's not just oh, and cleaning your backpack. They said that clean off the park ranger was telling us the other day, clean off your backpack, clean off your shoes before you hit a trail. And I mean, it's that's where we're at now. I mean, these places to be able to allow them to be biodiverse as they're, you know, intended as nature intended, we have to take those steps. But I never thought that far, you know, I know you pick up trash everywhere you go, Michael. <laughs> it's so <laughs> awesome. I love that. But it's true. I mean, it's about what else, what else can we do? And, and it's very easy to just clean off your shoes before you go on a trail. It is, and, and, and I, I do pick up trash, and my wife sometimes thinks that I'm, I act like I'm homeless. Um, but I've also done a lot of habitat restoration here in Santa Barbara, and that really, and I would encourage anybody if they've never done habitat restoration to find a, a local group that, that you might be able to volunteer with or, or, or work with for even a short period of time. Because you're out in nature, you're, you're rehabilitating trails, you're learning about the natural ecosystem, you're, you're trying to put back the natural order of things to the degree that we can. Um, but, you know, and, I, and that's why I talk about in my book, I talk about a place where you can go hiking, but also how you can respect nature. And I, and I agree with you. It's so important to me as I know it is to you guys. Um, and I always tell people, you know, look, when you go up to the, you know, I live right by what's called the San Marcos Preserve, which is my favorite place mm. almost on the planet. Um, but I always tell people when I see them on the trail, say, you know, this, this is their house. You're, you're a guest. Anytime you go to a park, Anytime you, you go any place, for the most part, you're a guest of something else. So mm. treat it that way. You wouldn't. I don't want people coming to my house and throwing beer bottles on the grass, going, "Hey, I had a great time." You know, you want people to come to your house and respect your house and and with a full guests. bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> for me, never. <laughs> that never happened. But, you know, I, I, I know. I want people. I want people to explore not only the Channel Islands, but also some of we've got you know a, a ton of parks here uh, within the mm. county. And, uh, yeah, the, and in fact, they own like 8,000 acres all total. And, and I want people to go explore some of those. But I also want people to realize that, you know, you're a guest. When you walk into that county park or that city park or even a local pocket park that you may have, you're a guest of that environment. So you have to mm -hmm. act that way and, and respect the environment. And the more you do, and that sounds kind of hokey at first, but, you know, the more you do, the more you're a guest and you, you begin to be part mm -hmm. of that. Uh, it, just as a side note, I remember when I was learning to get certified to go scuba diving, uh, we were out at the Channel Islands and uh, we'd gotten certified and one of the first dives I had done uh, after being certified, you know, people go down and they see fish and they go, oh my goodness, fish, and they start chasing the fish because they want to see fish. Well, I, you know, you're supposed to be with a buddy, but everybody had left. And I thought, well, I don't want to go chasing after fish. I just want to sit here and kind of see what happens. So I actually literally sat down on the bottom of the ocean floor, we're about 60 feet down, and everyone else had left, which probably wasn't the smartest idea for me, but I just sat there and didn't do anything. And within a few moments, all the fish that were scared away because everyone's flailing about trying to like chase fish and see fish, which I understand, it's cool to see them, but they all came back. And they were all mm -hmm. just swimming right by me. I mean, granted, I've got the air bubbles going up, but they're, they're, that doesn't bother them. And I literally just sat there like watching TV almost, except that I was in it. Uh, and just watching nature just take its course and do what it does 
because I'm a guest. I'm a guest in yeah. that environment on the bottom of the ocean floor with the Channel Islands, watching what all these fish want to do without all of us getting in their way. And it was so cool. I got to say, it was really a really cool experience. You know, that's exactly how you know Nancy and I mm. do our hikes. You know, we it is about to us. It's about slowing down. It's not about being an athlete. And one of the things we've learned on our tour of, of going to parks and and is is number one, all parks are important. You know, when we started yeah. our Spirit of America tours, all national park units. So that means forts and uh, trails like the Anza Trail and islands like the Channel Islands, Yosemite, and then national seashores like Point, uh, Point Reyes. And But when we were out, we learned, and that's why some of our, our tours changed accordingly, um, all parks are important. The county parks, the regional parks, the state parks are just as important, and you will see just as amazing treasures in those parks as you will in the national parks. Um, it's it, it is it is about a level of management, and and in politics I didn't say that, but um, at the end of the day they're all supposed to be protected. And the other thing we learned was, you know, it just kind of goes with you know you were talking about you know the chasing of the fish, and yeah, I understand that. And however, a lot of people we found they didn't go into national parks because they thought they had to be some Olympic athlete. That, you know, hey, I have to be able to, you know, camp in the wilderness and, you know, I don't have shoes like that, you know, and I don't know how to do a backpack. And so we started a group, a Facebook group. It's, hey, we're a small little group of people, but we have some bigger initiatives coming up. Just heads up everyone on this um, to get people to take a one hour walk. And it's not really about how long you go. It's about being observant and and looking at where you are and the experiences and the one hour walk thing is a big big deal it's about getting out getting some fresh air getting healthy um but in this group this facebook uh, group everyone hashtag one hour walk you should join it michael i want to see your photos yeah. bunnies in yeah. there but santa barbara has come up we have a, uh, one of our members um in santa barbara he's been posting some trails and it's cool because it's in they're in your book so now i'm like I know where you are, dude. <laughs> you know? So the one is the Snyder Trail, and some of the hikes that he—I mean, it's amazing. You're in these historic, you know, the historic town, and then all of a sudden, he, here's the coast and the wildflowers. I'm just like, this is amazing. Santa Barbara is so beautiful. Um, but the Snyder Trail is what he posted from this weekend, and so I mean, this is right by the uh, the Los Padres Forest, which is you know yep. behind you, and it's this trail is incredible. This is amazing, and, and and there's like interesting history from there, just even and the CCC history. And I, you live in an incredible area. I want to go hiking out there really badly. It's beautiful. Well, I appreciate you saying that. In fact, in, in my book, I actually mentioned someone else's book. There's a guy named Robert Stone who's been writing about hikes in Santa Barbara for for decades, and he has some of the most comprehensive books on you know the 50 best hikes or the 100 best hikes or you know, and he breaks it down by front country and back country and, and beachfront. And, and I actually mentioned him and I tell people to go, go buy that book, um, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm with you. I, I want people to, granted, we've got some amazing buildings here and some beautiful architecture and we're known for that. And there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a glory in some of what we've created here in Santa Barbara in the past in terms of our architectural heritage. We've had some of the top architects in the world come here, which thrills me to no end. Um, but the greatest architect is what Mother Nature does to me. And mm. to see rock formations, I mean, I live right by a nature preserve and I'm up there almost every day hiking. Um, and I, I've been on every trail, I know them all. <laughs> but, you know, every day is different, whether it's foggy or it's sunny or it's raining or whether it's overcast or, or whether there's roadrunners out. I see roadrunners up there or whether it's a tarantula or a snake or anything. And, um, cool. you know, a while ago I was... I was looking down at, at a little ant hole, there a bunch of big red ants, and I was just watching them, and just fascinated. And these kids got all, if we're coming up the trail, got all kind of freaked out, and they thought it was a snake. And I had a chance to talk to them and say, you know, if it was a snake, that'd be so cool, I mean, because snakes, are, they're not going to hurt you. You know, mm -hmm. and I talk about, I actually talk about in my book what happens if you encounter a, you know, quote unquote, scary animal when you're hiking, because they're not scary. They're not going to hurt you. They're not out to. <laughs> You know, to rip you off or to they're do anything bad. They're not the creature from the Black Lagoon. No. <laughs> they're not the creature from the Black Lagoon. And the more we don't get freaked out by those little things, as you kind of alluded to, uh, the more we embrace nature and respect it. So if there is a snake on the trail, okay, so you walk around it. You know, you don't have to like go, oh, I'm going to leave. You don't have to freak out and, and, and go away. You can actually 
work with that snake. Um, I, I've been running where I've jumped over snakes many, many times. Um, or, you know, if it's a big snake and you're scared, you go the other way. But there's never any need to be afraid of our natural environment and our natural world. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have to respect it. Um, I used to own a boat, and when I would take guests out on my boat in the ocean, and we were a small 14-foot boat, we sat low in the water. Um, I was very cognizant of, you know, the ocean's a greater force than me, and I have to respect mm -hmm. that and understand that. And the same thing when I'm hiking. You don't do goofy hikes where it's like, I'm going to, you know, I might fall down. We don't want to do that. You don't want to be in some place where you might mm -hmm. drop 100 feet and hurt yourself. But you do want to still go enjoy nature and not be afraid of anything. I run across all sorts. I run across coyotes up in the, in the preserve, and they're not out for blood, you know. Um, neither are the snakes. The snakes are just hanging out, just sunning themselves. They the just want to go. Actually, they want to be away from us. I mean, we exactly. see coyotes almost every day on our morning walks, and so cool. they just look at us, and they're like, oh, you're taking the same route we are. We actually have a hawk that flies as we walk. It's like, so funny. It's crazy, but they, they get to, <laughs> like, it, it's like, from pole to pole, you know, and, and, and then, you know, he was like, okay, I'm going to get ahead of you. And as soon as we'll get there, he's like, okay, onto the next. We've had yeah, some, yeah. you know, snakes. We've got them out here. Let me tell you, are out in the desert, but it's about being aware. And I think that's the, the beauty of these creatures is that they make us look and have our eyes open. But you're right. I mean, be smart when you go out. I, I, out here in the desert, there's Fort Bowie National Historical Park. And it's one of the few parks that you actually have to hike to get to the visitor center. And if okay. you can, they will come and get you. They have a plan for that. Um, so you can go right to the fort. It's a it's a mile and a half hike yeah. in. And we did it in the summer with a ranger. And she said so many people, you know, especially if they're not from the area, do not think. And they she's had to, like, get people's shoes and stuff because they'll start hiking barefoot. That's you know, and you're in the <laughs> desert. I mean, we're in the Sonoran Desert. I mean, we have rattlesnakes, you know, everywhere, and tarantulas, which we saw there, um, and and they're cool. It's, it's the, they they don't want to come after you, but be aware so you don't stand on them. You know, because that's when you get into trouble. Just yeah, be don't aware. mess with them. Yeah, they're beautiful, and they're all part of the ecosystem. Everybody's part of everybody. You know. We found that we can just walk and sit down somewhere, and the birds mm -hmm. and and animals come. They all come out. I think they're a little curious too. You know, and they just come look around. They don't get too close. You know, so it's kind of like if you act like they do. Don't get close to them mm -hmm. because they don't appreciate it. And that's when you're going to get hurt. If you, you know, if you try to get close to something that you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Absolutely, Nancy. I, I totally agree. And that's why I, I made this little section about, you know, when you're on a trail, what should you do if you see an animal that you're like, I don't know what to do with this? Uh, because there is no need to be afraid. They're not, you know, they're, they're not out to hurt you. Um, they're just as, as probably nervous as you are. Um, mm. But it, it's interesting to me how I've been, up at the San Marcos Preserve here in my backyard, or even over on the Channel Islands, and people, you know, encounter something that's foreign to them, um, and they just flip out. And mm -hmm. there's no need to get that emotional about it. Number one, uh, it's just like, okay, what can I learn from this environment? How can I, how can I learn about, you know, some animal that I'm not familiar with? Um, you know, it, it, yeah. it's interesting because there, I, there's a lot of animals that I look at and I go, that's an ugly looking animal. Uh, but in fact, I'll give an example. There was a possum who I found in my, uh, dead in my backyard the other, uh, the other week. And I felt oh, bad. I, they're unattractive, you know, animals, but they're vegetarians and they're harmless. They're not going to hurt anybody. So I called animal control to come out and pick him up because he was yeah. kind of a big boy. Um, oh. but I started thinking, you know, again, I, I've kind of created an environment in my house where I want animals to come, whether they roam through in a matter of minutes or they stay for days or weeks, um, because they yeah. they were here first, um, and when people come here, and especially when people go down to the beach here in Santa Barbara, I, I want people to see dolphins, I want them to see whales, I want them to see all the birds, but to see them, not to, you know, you don't have to go out and interact with them, I know we all want to, um, you know, and as a scuba diver, I, you know, I've interacted with, with a lot of different fish, but in their environment, and to the degree that I'm not trying to influence them or, or, or do something to, you know, it's funny because I, it, it kind of bothers me when I see people, you know, little kids chasing birds, which is kind of a natural yeah. thing. But the birds are like, they're just trying to eat. And so the more they're scared off, of course, they have to go find more food. And, you know, um, so it's the yeah, idea to educate people and, and, and letting people know that we're all part of this global environment. It's not just us and them. It's all of us. And we have an obligation to treat all animals 
uh, with as much respect as we can possibly muster. And sometimes it's hard because you come across something you go, whoa, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, but, mm. you know, it, the more you spend a night, the more one hour walks you do, the more Yay. you feel comfortable in your environment. Exactly. And then that's what we've started doing is, is you know, just really showcasing, you know, for us, we're, we've got a whole article series now just on one hour walks, just to prove that you can go out. Even if you're in a wheelchair, there are places you can go. And a lot of times that gets thrown out the window. If you're a mom pushing kids in a stroller, you need a place to go that you can still be part of nature. And I think those kinds of places are crucial to our cities, our urban areas. That's what I love also. What I learned from your book is that you have a lot of natural areas within an urban area. I mean, that's you don't have to go out into the boonies to enjoy nature. Um, some places you do. And then you need to get involved with your community and start going, how do we you know, bring green spaces back? Is it community Maybe. gardens? I mean, you know, it, put plant, native plants everywhere, <laughs> everywhere, and build parks, you know? It's important, but Santa Barbara definitely, to me, quality of life is, is key over there um, from everything I've read and chatting with you, Michael. It's been such a pleasure to have you back on the show with us. Uh, thank you well, so thank much you for so joining us. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, bragging about uh, Santa Barbara. <laughs> well, we like this. Now yeah, we're, we, like we feel prepared when we go. You know, this, you know, Anthony Bourdain is like not a, um, let's put it this way. I know he doesn't plan all his travels and everything, but he's, he's picky about what he's going to read about a destination. And I think he would read your book out of anybody else's travel book. <laughs> I'm going to a destination because it's got the interesting things in there. Those nit, those nit bits. I have to nit go back bit. to that. I've got to, I have my new word that, you know, you want to have those fun, you know, Hey, I want to go because of this, you know, and because there is a cemetery you can go hang out. <laughs> That's important. Cemeteries are like crucial parts of your destination <laughs> everybody needs to go there uh, but everyone the book again is by michael servin it's santa barbara know it all a guide to everything that matters again by michael servin it's out now through reedy press so go to amazon all those great places and also keep up with michael on twitter at michael servin and at his blog at servin's central coast dot blogspot dot com and again, uh, Santa Barbara know-it-all. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. And everyone, again, uh, for National Park Traveling in all parks around the world, go to nationalparktraveling.com. We've got some great travel planners on there. And also, don't forget, Big Glen Radio airs Sunday through Friday, uh, Monday and thir through Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Friday and Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. It's all listed and featured on bigblendradio.com. And Michael, we've got a special song for you. Oh, it's okay. called. <laughs> yeah, we, we love we love to play music for people. It's called California Days. It is by Josh Pfeiffer, and you can get the album. Everyone, it's joshpfeiffer.com. It's American Crooner Act One because it's all about those beautiful drives that you can yes. put the top down. And Santa Barbara, you can do that. And uh, we found your frontage roads to be quite cool to get onto when there's traffic. Yes. Um, people have wonderful flowers and fountains and there's little wine stores and all kinds of cool stuff. So all I'm going to say is go on the frontage roads, right, Michael? Is that, is yes, that a absolutely. Thing? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us. Here it is, everybody. California Days. California days Where the sunshine Smiles on every face Where the ocean breezes blow And the swaying palm trees grow I love California days Take a drive on down the coast Find the things you love the most From the Golden Gate to La Jolla Bay Everybody knows it's true So there's nothing you can do But pack your bags and head on down this way California Day
on your days I got my sunshades and put the rack top down to stay We could head to Monterey and watch that sunset fade away I love California day Take a drive on down the coast Find the things you love the most From the Golden Gate to La Jolla Bay Everybody knows it's true So there's nothing you can do But pack your bags and head on down this way To California Day To California Day 